welcome back to my channel. Um, in today's video I'm going to be reviewing this book here that I read recently. Um, it's called In Praise of Slow. How... Sorry. It's just noise, noise, I hate noise. Sorry. Right, yeah, so it's called In Praise of Slow. How a Worldwide Movement is Challenging the Cult of Speed. And it's written by um, a guy called Carl Honore who's a um, Canadian um, journalist, but he lives in London. Um, and um, it's also, it was also actually as heard on Book of the Week on BBC Radio 4. Um, I came across this book um, when I was um, in my rider reading. Um, it's actually, again, when I was reading that book, The Discovery of Slowness by Stena Dolny, and I did some research on that, and I came across this wider slow movement. And um, in Praise of Slow by Carl Honore, it's said to be the Bible of the international slow movement, which is a sort of multifaceted um, kind of uh, um, mixture of different, different organisations working in different areas that are all advocating a sort of slower way of life. Now, I read this book because I live in the fast lane. Um, you know, I have so much to do. Um, I, and I often feel, you know, the weight of time upon me because, you know, there's never enough time to read all the books and try every recipe because I have very intense interests, um, you know, reading and, of course, cooking and these are, like, the two intense, uh, intense interests that I guess do dominate my life and give me meaning and everything but there is this sense of pressure because I feel like I need to try, like, literally everything. Obviously, that means that um, as long as I have access to these interests, it obviously means that I don't experience too much in a way of boredom because I always have, you know, these interests are always there, um, which is, you know, you could say it's a good thing, but I do feel under a lot of pressure. Um, you know, so I need to learn, I guess, how to slow down in that regard. Um, now, Carl Honore himself is actually a reformed speedaholic, um, and he studies the slow movement in order to train himself to slow down. Um, your book covers all facets of the movement, from food, reading, music, urban design, and more. Now, there's even um, a society for the deceleration of time, believe it or not. The history of our relationship to time is documented. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, many people worked at their own pace, or to natural time, so they followed the natural rhythms, you know, the, the sun, um, the cycle of the, um, you know, the, the moon and sun, all the natural rhythms, um, and, you know, as opposed to clock time. But in, So in order to instill clock time into workers, punctuality was promoted as a moral virtue around the sort of time of the Industrial Revolution, and this took time to kind of inculcate this... Um, creed of, uh, of um, punctuality into workers took time because workers weren't used to it. They were used to working to their own schedules. Um, so this kind of standardisation of time that really took off in the Industrial Revolution and has sort of um, been, I guess, a chain around many people's necks ever since. Um, the slowness, of course, was seen as a sin, you know, one of the cardinal sins, sloth. Now, global capitalism, of course, privileges speed, competition, Productivity and efficiency, that's how global capitalism works, as its main values, and time is reduced to money. Time is money. However, this mindset is damaging the environment and it reduces humanity to mere use value, as humans are seen as disposable inputs whose value is reduced to how much money they make and how much they contribute to the GDP. And it has since um, recently, there's been a global backlash against um, this, um, against the cult of speed, and this backlash has many arms, which this book covers. Japan, even, has a sloth club, which argues that we should copy some of the basic behaviours of a sloth in order to protect the environment and bring peace. A sloth club, how cool is that? I wish we had one of those in this country, I'd certainly want to join it. And recently, more and more people are getting involved in a voluntary simplicity movement, um, which advocates downshifting or the move to a less consumerist existence, which of course goes against the grain of global capitalism, because global capitalism wants us to consume more and more and more, buy more and more and more things, you know, we're all, we're, we're all kind of, in a sense, brainwashed by it. I mean, I know I am, we all are, but we'd be kind of deceiving ourselves if we said it didn't affect us, because every single person is affected by consumer society and its impulse to buy, 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 do we really need it, you know, and all this waste. Um, 
So, yeah, the voluntary simplicity movement is kind of advocating sort of change in mindset to a more kind of uh, mindful way of um, buying. Do we, you know, asking serious questions like, do we really need this item? Can we live without it? In terms of food, the slow food movement was founded in Italy by a guy called Carlo Petrini, and its logo is the snail, which calmly eats its way through life. <laughs> this movement opposes the fast food that is represented by McDonald's. It advocates local, seasonal, artisanal production, leisurely dining, and it seeks to protect the environment. The movement has even set up the Ark of Taste, which collects traditional food that is on the verge of extinction, things like purple asparagus. Meanwhile, the Slow Cities movement seeks to cut noise and traffic and increase green spaces and pedestrian zones. I am definitely a disciple of the Slow Cities movement. Anything that reduces noise is good in my book, and... Green spaces are calming, you know, so we're talking here about more trees, more parkland, thumbs up to that. There's even slow reading. For example, people are encouraged to reflect on what they read by writing down key quotes or keeping a diary. Quality is privileged over quantity. So instead of like binge reading and trying to read as many books as you can, you know, like a sort of bucket list of books, you know, I know I'm tempted by that, you know, and it's, I guess probably many people are, you know, needing to read as great a number of books as possible and this kind of feeling of, um, you know, almost like stupidity if you don't keep up, but maybe we need to kind of reassess our values, and I need to remember this, as I say, because I, I often feel that I am reading slowly, or I've not read enough, but the way I read, which is methodical, detailed and slow, actually aids memory, and so can be a good thing. I, I t I'm a very slow reader, because I need to read slowly in order to understand what I'm reading. Um, comprehension of a text you know, takes time for me, it takes time for me to process information, and instead of trying to, like, kind of think, of, beat myself up about that, maybe I just need to kind of think, actually, this is a good thing, because it means I remember things, I take in information at a deeper level, and, I, you know, that can only be a good thing, really. Now, the modern education system and its emphasis on speed is criticised. At school, often the only thing that matters is coming top of the class. There is endless homework, exams, and a rigid curriculum. And I think that's the case even more nowadays, even than when I was growing up back in the 90s, and a curriculum was first introduced when I was a young child at school. Um, but things are a lot worse now than when I was at school. I don't think when I was growing up in the 90s, um, you know, when I was at primary school, I don't think we had quite as much homework as what primary school kids get these days. Um, you know, but children, as well as adults, are more productive and less stressed when they learn or work at a slower pace at their own time. There's even a German word for this, which is Eigenzeit. Eigen in German means own, and Zeit means time. time. So doing something at, it, at, at your own time, or giving the time to giving something the time it needs. Um, so not rushing a task, if that task needs to, done slow, needs to be done slowly. I mean, certainly there are some tasks that need to be done quickly. This isn't about, um, you know, renouncing all speed, because that would be absolutely absurd, and downright stupid it's about looking at how much time a task takes um you know what is its eigenzeit and not rushing a task that needs to be done slowly um now there's a, a deep, there's a guy called morris holt who's a professor of education um in america and he wrote that and he wrote the slow schooling manifesto this argues that children should take time to explore subjects deeply and to learn to think rather than how to pass exams the book argues that we should do fewer things or do a few things well and ignore the rest. Activities such as cooking, reading and walking are encouraged, as is the importance of sitting still in a quiet place doing nothing at all. Doing nothing can even be productive as it encourages slow thinking. Fast thinking is rational, linear and reactive. It is what we do when we are under pressure. Slow thinking is creative. And we do this when the pressure is off. For example, when we are just lying in bed, walking, or soaking in a bath, we might come up with new solutions to problems, as insights from our unconscious bubble up. And, uh, you know, this often happens to me, actually, when I'm having a bath, I sometimes, like, talk to myself um, in the bath, and this sometimes helps me to work through problems and to come to new insights. Um, so, yeah, so that can be good, because you're doing it, on, you're doing it in a relaxed way. A Zen master is quoted as saying, instead of saying, don't just sit there, do something, 
we should say the opposite. Don't just do something, sit there. I don't know about you, but I do feel that I always need to be productive and learning because I'm a very active, energetic person. I'm very hyper in more ways than one. I have a lot of energy. And whereas when I was a kid, that energy was expended through physical activity and a lot of running around and hyperactivity and like basically hardly ever sitting still, as an adult, I'm less hyper in that way, although I still have that element of hyperactivity in me, but um, it's more now like soaking up information, it's, it's endless need to kind of stimulate my mind and actually not doing anything at all can actually make me feel very anxious. Like if I were to just sit there without stimulating myself or without actually doing something, I can feel quite anxious because it feels like there's a sort of void. Um, so, and it can make me feel quite stressed. I think also because I'm very anxious, so what happens is my mind tends to fill up with like anxious thoughts, whereas doing things can be like a source of distraction. But I do think I need to remember that not doing anything can actually be restorative and generative and can maybe like allow me to be better at the tasks I do when I'm busy. Being slow has historically carried stigma and been synonymous with stupidity and laziness, as I mentioned before. However, this is simply an art artefact of modern consumer society. I suffered at school because I could not keep up as I struggled to learn at the rate expected of me. I was in the slow stream, you know, I was considered like special needs as they used to call it then, which of course carries a great deal of stigma and can affect one for all your life because you feel stupid, you know, you're looking, you know, there are kids in your class, you know, that are like high achievers and are getting top grades and are in a fast stream and you're put like in a sort of special educational needs set or in a sort of slow, you know, with teaching assistants and... You, you feel stupid, it affects your self-esteem. Now, of course, I know I'm not stupid. Um, you know, I've had an IQ test as an adult with a psychologist to prove that. I'm not stupid at all. I've got a very high verbal IQ. So, and, and you know, and I later on in life, I went to university and I got a good degree. Um, I'm a late developer, but I take my time over things, you know. And because the school system privileges those who uh, think quickly, you know, like that, and can cope in this sort of fast-paced environment, Many people, you know, get disillusioned and even fall out of the education system. I like to learn deeply and in depth. I cannot multitask. Um, accepting slowness is healthy, so we need to accept slowness. And more and more people are arguing a case for slow. I would like to find out more in particular about voluntary simplicity, simplicity, which argues that abundance is a state of mind as opposed to being rooted in material objects. I would also like to read more about slow reading. I will finish this review on a quote from Karl Honoré himself. The central tenet of a slow philosophy is taking the time to do things properly and thereby enjoy them more. So let me know what you think about this approach to life. Do you live life in a fast lane? Or do you want to slow down? Or do you already practice a slow approach to life? So do let me know in the comments box below. I do recommend this book. I enjoyed reading it. Um, it's um, as I say, it does cover a wide area, but um, it does get you thinking, you know, about the importance of being slow. So, as I, so, yeah, so do go and read this book if you want to find out more about the slow movement. So I'm going to be moving on now to video number two, where I'm going to be talking about Pancake Day and giving you a recipe I've tried.